Wow, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be a part of this program. And let me tell you why. I have an audience of folks who are deliberately and intentionally committed to learning from others, who came to be inspired and motivated, who are truly true believers in what does it mean to learn from others, to be innovative, to get excited about life. I don't get an audience like that too often, so I want you to be real clear. I'm happy. <laughs> well, you heard that I worked with a lot of people, a lot of special people, many of them in athletics. We talked about Tom Brady and Desmond Howard and Michael Phelps. But I've also worked with Division I athletes and amateur and professional athletes, people who were dying, doing anything they could to make it to the Olympics. I've worked with bronze medalists, silver medalists, gold medalists. The list goes on and on and on. But that's not who I'm talking about tonight. I'm talking about people like you. I've worked with hundreds, perhaps thousands, of individuals who allowed me to push them, to challenge them, to dare them to believe in themselves, to teach them the same bloody thing you teach Tom Brady. <laughs> if you don't believe in yourself, Tom, why should I believe in you? Talk about believing in yourself. There's a guy who we can count on to make it real. I've worked with hundreds of thousands of people who, whose names you will never know, whose faces you've never seen. And they allowed me to push one agenda that I really like pushing, and that is to be a little different. There's a lot of folks in this room that can relate because there's some folks in this room that are a little different. Am I right or wrong? <laughs> but being different is something that I've been invested in in a long time. I should probably share with you a story. 14 years old, I can remember like it was yesterday, 14, 15. My uncle comes to harass me as usual. At eight years old, he was amusing and I thought he was delightful. By 15, I couldn't stand him. <laughs> <laughs> he walks in and he's picking, he's poking, he's prodding, he's doing all he can to, to get on my last nerve and it's working. <laughs> and he then says to me, what do you want to be when you grow up? If it had been anyone else, I probably, probably would have said a doctor, a lawyer, you know, an engineer, a psychologist. But since it was him, I looked at him and said, what do I want to be? I want to be different. That irritated him to no end. <laughs> He's like, different? No, seriously, boy. What do you want to do when you're, when you're an adult? I said, seriously. I want to be different. Now, subconsciously, I was simply saying in a polite way, I didn't want to be like you. <laughs> if that's the future. <laughs> but think about it. You all remember being 14, 15, 16. And who wants to grow up given what we have seen with some of the adults in our lives? I was preoccupied at 14 with the fact that they seemed the majority or some were constantly complaining and whining and moaning and groaning and incessantly picking at each other and badgering each other. They were negative, miserable, and depressed. Why would I sign up for that? <laughs> well, it was not only that some were miserable, negative, and depressed. They recruited you. They said, come on in. This is the way the world is. This is what life is all about. Come on in here and you've got to pick a side. You've got to pick a religion. You've got to pick a politic. You've got to figure out how to make money and consume everything that you can and make sure that you think only about yourself. At 14, something in me was uniquely different. And I didn't want to be those people. Unfortunately, time uh, <laughs> beats you down. And I happened to be growing up in an era in American history that was a bit challenging. And the hate that hate made tried to consume me. I was angry. <laughs> I wasn't just miserable and depressed. I was ready to take on the world. But secretly, somewhere in the back of my mind was that obsession 
to not be that guy. Between 18 and 25, I was my own worst enemy. I was the worst enemy that you could have. And I began to understand clearly and distinctly that the only thing that exceeded my ignorance was my arrogance. <laughs> my thinking, I know exactly what's going on and this is the way the world is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Only to find out that I was deluded, programmed and socialized. Socialized to be prejudiced, socialized to be sexist, brainwashed into being a homophobe, a xenophobe, anti this, anti that, hating groups of people, groups. I remember trying to hate white folks. <laughs> and one day it dawned on me, it's too many. <laughs> this is not working. <laughs> uh, this is, mm. This is too much work. <laughs> I had to give it up for Lent, you know. <laughs> but the hate that hate made, it was consuming me. I had to return to a vision of a 14-year-old. I'm 25 years old, and I have to return and try to capture what a 14-year-old me saw. Well... As indicated, I've worked with a lot of folk, more than just mega stars. I've worked with CEOs and entrepreneurs and Fortune 100 companies. I've had a chance to work with uh, the privileged, the entitled. I've had a chance to work with the poor and the disenfranchised, alcoholics and addicts. And guess what? They have more in common than you think. All of them want their lives to work. All of them want to dream bigger. They want to believe in something greater than themselves. They want to commit to something. They want to learn how to improve their performance and maintain that improvement over time. That's what I, the majority of folks like. I also discovered that the majority were not negative, miserable, and depressed. The majority was like you, dreamers, believers, People who want the world to work. Now, if you have never been needed before, you are sorely needed now. This country, this culture, this world is desperately seeking leadership of a different ilk, of a different kind. People who want to build each other up, not tear them down. People who want to ju just invest in one another and to dream big, believe big, and become big in the most positive sense of the words. What else they have in common is most of them don't like pain. You thought, I forgot you. I didn't. <laughs> most of them don't like pain. There are two motivating factors in our world, the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. Am I right or wrong? <laughs> and we're talking about not just physical pain. We're talking about emotional, psychological pain. People will do anything to get away from it. Reminds me of a story. The first job I had after grad school, I worked in a, as a clinical therapist. And I was on the job two weeks and two days. Two weeks and two days. When the boss walked up to me and said, Greg, we've got, had an inpatient last night coming to the ER, overdosed uh, and attempted suicide. Uh, our counselors, several of them have already gone up. And have been rejected. <laughs> and um, we sent our senior counselor up and it didn't go so well. <laughs> we sent our psychiatrist to see her. Ooh, that wasn't pleasant at all. <laughs> I even went to see her and uh, I, quite frankly, I, I did my best and it didn't work. How would you like to go see her? <laughs> Who in their right mind? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not stupid. <laughs> I, I don't want to go see this woman. So I looked him dead in the eye and I said, yes, sir, I'll be glad to try. <laughs> <laughs> two weeks, two days. So you can imagine that elevator ride up to the fifth floor. The demons of despair, <laughs> fear and self-doubt, <laughs> attacked. <laughs> Fool, you've been here two weeks and two days. <laughs> what you going to do? <laughs> well, how are you going to approach this young woman? I said, look, but 
Fear and self-doubt forgot one thing. I had already decided that they were predictable, therefore manageable. I knew they would show up. So I said hello and dismissed them because I had 90 seconds to figure out my next move. <laughs> right? Fifth floor. Here's her room. I bounce into her room, the most excited person on the planet Earth. I'm, I got on a suit and a tie, and I'm just giddy and excited. And I make it real clear that I am about to explode with enthusiasm. She pulled the cover over her head and buried her head under two pillows. <laughs> I continued. I said, I, I, I just couldn't wait to meet you. I heard that you were an amazing human being who happened to do the impossible. I heard that you were on the football team and were the first young lady to join the football team. And I just wanted to know, are you a kicker? Are you a quarterback? Did you break your leg? Did you hurt your shoulder? She put her cover down and looked at this idiot in her room. <laughs> she said, I am not a football player. I haven't broken my leg. <laughs> I said, well, wow, I then who are you? Oh, doesn't matter. I don't want to talk to you or anyone. I said, well, why is that? Because you're going to say the same thing everyone else has said that's walked into my room. You're going to tell me I'm too young and that I haven't thought about and I haven't led any life whatsoever and I have so much to live for. I said, oh. I changed my body language and the tone of voice. I looked and got all up in her face and all in her space. And I asked her. Have I done anything like anybody that you've met so far? She said, no, sir. <laughs> I said, well, they don't tell me how I'm going to act and what I'm going to do and how I'm going to approach it. Don't put me in a box. Got it? Yes, sir. I said, you want to tell me why you decided to take yourself out? We engaged. She told me a story that broke my heart. She told me a story that the first I was angry when she started. And by the time it was done, I was sad. This 15-year-old girl who had attempted suicide the night before and was dating a 27-year-old guy who had introduced her to every drug imaginable. It was a household of drug-addicted, poly-drug-addicted individuals, and she was the one that was responsible for taking care of the household and cooking and cleaning and everything else. Did I mention the 27-year-old was paraplegic? and needed tremendous amount of care. She was broke down, worn out, mentally, physically, perhaps sexually abused. I was in tears by the time she finished. I looked at her and I told her, I understand. I understand completely. She said, what? I said, you're 15 years old. You wanted the pain to stop. And what else could you come up with? She said, Seriously? I said, yes. She said, thank you so much for understanding. I said, while I understand, I don't agree <laughs> with your strategy. What you came up with was a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Would you allow me to help you examine some options? She agreed. Together, we began to work in six months, this young woman transformed herself, and all I did was teach her the same thing I would teach anyone that comes in my space, that self-love and self-acceptance is the critical piece to the puzzle. Looking outside of yourself for self-worth and self-esteem will not work. I taught her and encouraged her to understand that she must practice, train, and rehearse, believing in herself more than anyone else, to trust herself, and to stop thinking that someone that needs you Loves you. Months later, I ran into her family and they joked about this maniac who popped into their daughter's room and asked her to be a, see the world a little bit differently. I love seeing the world differently. As a matter of fact, I had to change my whole attitude and my whole outlook on life to become sophisticated enough to be a professional in, a, in an environment, in an arena where I get paid to do what I would do for free. Build people up. Try to be positive in a negative world. <laughs> what I teach people is how to stay sane in an insane world. 
But I'm not here to talk to you just about what you hear all the time. Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. I need more from you. I'm here to recruit. I need you to not just believe it. I need you to teach it, preach it. I need you to push the agenda. I need this majority to become, stop being silent. This world is desperately in need of the visions that are in this room. There's some big dreams in this room. There's some big dreams in this room, but dreaming's not enough. I need you to believe, not just in yourself, but in your dream and who you want to become. Your behavior should match your beliefs, but you need to push this agenda. This culture, this society, this world is in desperate need of leaders like you to not sit back and just process and analyze. <laughs> we need you to take, take the world by storm. My wife who's here tonight, the magnificent Shalia Hardin. <laughs> she would tell you, this is a quote, to live your best life now. Think about that. To deliberately and intentionally grasp and become committed to being the best friend you ever had in your life. Your best friend has to be you. What I did was created a mantra for myself. And that mantra, you know how you heard, I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. I went further. I went on, I sh must, I shall, I will, I can transform myself, change myself, believe in myself, stop being obsessed with the negative and pursue the positive. I must, I shall, I will, I can become obnoxiously optimistic and get on people's nerves being so bloody happy. <laughs> you understand? But what do you teach a Tom Brady? I can't teach Tom Brady how to throw a ball. You think I taught Michael Phelps? Michael, this is the proper technique for entering the water on your backstroke. <laughs> All I can tell him is the same thing I'm telling you. To practice, train, and rehearse. Given 100%, 100% of the time. If you can teach yourself to give 100% of the stuff you don't even like, <laughs> what happens when you get to the stuff you love? You've created a habit of giving 100%. If you can practice, train, and rehearse. If you practice, train, and rehearse being optimistic, you'll be an optimist. If you practice, train, and rehearse being negative, miserable, and depressed, you'll be good at it. <laughs> if you practice, train, and rehearse being trustworthy and dependable or God-fearing, whatever you can come up with, that's what you will become. I'm asking you to simply believe with all your heart, with all your nerves, with every sinew in your body that this world is worth living in. But I need you to push an agenda. So, you know, time is no longer a friend of mine, so let me leave you with this. Six is a magic number for me, and I'm going to say something six times, six times, six times. I'm not asking you to repeat after me. You understand? All you got to do is make sure I say it six times. Are you ready? I believe in myself. 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 You couldn't help but think about it, could you? <laughs> you couldn't help it. Oh, you just programmed yourself. You understand? <laughs> Practice, train, and rehearse. Believe in yourself. Understand that you're no different from Desmond Howard, Tom Brady, Michael Phelps. They simply had a, a skill set. But they all had to believe without question or pause that they could have the world. Thank you so much for listening to me.